I work for Eugene Science Center, and we are in our next segment of Next Gen STEM. Our innovator of the week this week is a biomedical engineer, patented inventor, and author of the children's book series, Abby Invents. She is from a small island in the Caribbean called Dominica, Dominica, sorry, and currently lives in Portland, Oregon. So everyone, please welcome Dr. Arlene Simon. Thank you so much, Elena. It's such a pleasure to meet you and to be here today. Thank you for inviting me and thank you for this amazing introduction. Awesome. Yeah, thanks so much for joining us. So we sent out a workbook a little bit earlier this week and it had talked about how a messy science experiment that you did at age five inspired you. We had a couple questions of what that messy science experiment was. <laughs> That's a really good question. Um, so yeah, I was five growing up in the Caribbean. My mom came home with a book called Simple Chemistry for Kids. And that messy experiment involved us getting lots of little containers around the house, filling them with water, then putting sand in one container, mud in another, pepper sauce in another, <laughs> salt in another, and really observing which, which substance dissolved in water. Of course, the salt would dissolve, the sand would not, and the mud, there may be some elements in the soil that did to make it messy, but I just remember it being really fun and at the end having conversations of which one dissolved in the water and why do you think it dissolved? And awesome. that, that was my first introduction to science. Yeah. Awesome. That does sound fun and very messy for those. Yeah. <laughs> I love it. So um, you are in the world of engineering and what interested you most in engineering? Ah, engineering. So I stumbled into engineering, honestly. And why I chose to do chemical engineering as my undergrad was a chemical engineer came and he spoke to my class and he said with a degree in chemical engineering, he could never ever have a boring career. And as a college student, I mean, I don't want to ever be bored. So that was really the decision that made me switch majors from chemistry to chemical engineering. And he said that, you know, as a chemical engineer, he could work in cosmetics, design new lipstick formulations. He could work in the pharmaceutical industry, make new medicine. He could work in automotive industry and help design cars or work in manufacturing. And I liked the flexibility that an engineering degree provided. And so that's why I switched majors almost immediately from chemistry to chemical engineering. <laughs> awesome. Yeah, that does sound good. Um, so what made you choose this particular path when applying engineering into your career? Um, I would say the path chose me. I, I can't say I chose this path. Um, I think one of the things as an engineer uh, that drives me is I'm very curious. And so the reasons I've had such a interesting career trajectory is because I choose jobs that I may not know what it's going to be like, but I want to know. And so uh, my first job after my PhD was designing syringes, and I never learned how to design a syringes in my class. But I know when I go to the hospital, I may get poked for an injection and they use a syringe. And so I wanted to know who designs syringes and how do they do that and how do they make sure that no matter what drug goes into that tube, uh, it is biocompatible and nothing bad leaches from the plastic material into our blood. And then, I, and then when I was finished with that job, or not really finished, but when I felt like I learned as much as I could learn and the boredom was starting to kick in, then I saw a position to design supercomputers. And somebody reached out to me actually and said, hey, would you be interested in designing a supercomputer? And I said, well, that sounds interesting, <laughs> why not? And so then I went to design supercomputers. And then after I worked in that role for two years, I wanted to be closer to healthcare again, to be closer to the patients and, and so then I saw a position to design medical imaging equipment 
And again, I did not study how to design ultrasounds or CAT scans, but I was curious. So I said, well, let me apply. And here I am today. So I would say my curiosity is really what causes me to do all these fascinating things in my engineering career. I love that. That's so fun. Um, so what is it that you do specifically in biomedical engineering and what other jobs and STEM disciplines make up the rest of your team? Yeah. Fascinating question. So as a biomedical engineer, I design ultrasounds and CAT scans. Uh, so I basically help doctors see inside our bodies better. And so what that entails is I help choose the right computing hardware, whether it be the computer chips, whether it be the storage, because you have to store the data somewhere, what type of wireless uh, in equipment would you need to partner to pair with that equipment. And so those are the type of things I think about so that ultimately when a radiologist, when a physician takes an image of your body and then sends it to a radiologist so the radiologist can analyze, when that image gets to the radiologist, it should be of the highest image resolution. Um, you know, we've all taken photos with our, our smartphones and they may be blurry. Well, you can't have that if you're trying to diagnose someone. Uh, so the technology that goes in there are some of the things that I think about. And as for my team, so I focus on the hardware side. And so there are other folks on my team who focus on the software side where we try to figure out, well, uh, so it's good to have this hardware, but can I make it run faster? Can I make, how can I make it faster? Uh, can I optimize my code uh, to make it so that when the physician sees the image, um, there may be some elements of that image that's already analyzed. And so some people uh, on my team also are artificial intelligence experts. And so they may write these algorithms that um, you know, be able to detect, similar to how Facebook puts that square around your face and says, you're talking to our lead or you're talking to mm -hmm. Elena. Well, there may be a square that pops up that says, you know, hey, physician, you should look over there. I think that may be a tumor. And so that's mm -hmm. one of the areas where artificial intelligence helps. Uh, there are other people on my team who are marketing experts, and so they study the market trends. Uh, right now with the COVID-19 pandemic, several radiologists are working from home, and so we have to figure out, is this behavior going to continue after the pandemic is over? Do we need to modify the way we develop these technologies to enable radiologists to access these very, very large images from their home networks? And so that's what my team looks like. Awesome. That's very fun. Um, what are other paths some non-biomedical engineers could take in their careers? You kind of mentioned that a little bit, um, but what are some other ways people can follow their curiosity when obtaining it or after obtaining an engineering degree? Ah, uh, um, there. That's the beautiful thing about curiosity. You can go whichever way uh, you want to go. I always say I go where the wind blows. <laughs> and so um, in, I've, I've had many friends and I'm, uh, who are engineers who some work at Disney, um, you know, to create new apps like Disney Plus app. Um, there are other engineers who are tissue engineers. Uh, that was one of the courses I actually took early in my, in my, in my college, uh, really trying to understand how you can make artificial tissues. Uh, so that for burn victims, you are able to provide them with tissues. I mean, that is, that is really cool. Um, there may be other engineers who study microbes uh, because they are fascinated by the world of germ. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and so they want to understand how microbes grow, how they work, and how we can protect ourselves from germs. Um, I mean, you could design lipsticks. There's so many things you can do with science. It's, it's, it's limitless. Awesome. That's so cool. And um, so do you spend time, more of your time updating current technology or looking to invent new technology for the software or hardware that you work with? That's a good question. Um, I would say it's kind of 50-50. <laughs> um, so uh, in terms of updating uh, the hardware, uh, the reason why we're able to update it is because we meet very regularly with our customers. And our customers tell us, you know, five years from now, this is what I want my fancy schmancy ultrasound machine to be able to do. And the technology may not exist today to create, to, to do that. 
And so then we have these brainstorming sessions where we ideate uh, how can we uh, create new technology to help meet the customer need. Or there may be instances where we already have a, a pretty solid existing uh, hardware and we just want to be able to make slight updates to it. And so that's where the software piece comes in. Where you're able to push these updates. I mean, you may see updates come across your phone sometimes where your phone says updating. And so being able to understand how to push these, these over the air or over the wire updates uh, to systems is also something that we think about. Very cool. All right. And um, we did have a fun audience question. You kind of mentioned this a little bit, but what types of machines do you work with? Ooh. Uh, machines. Well, I don't know if I would say I work with a machine, but <laughs> um, but some of the things that I do when I when I was back in the office would be in the lab, and and sometimes we have to actually assemble uh, the computer systems before we send them to the customer. So you can think of it like Lego pieces, how you stick little bricks uh, together uh, to create new Lego structures. And so in the lab, we'd have a circuit board, we'd have the computer chip, which is the thing that that's like the brain of the computer. And so I have to stick it on to the, the circuit board. Um, when you are running a lot of processes on your computer, it's gonna be hot. And so we have to think of how do we cool it? And so we'll get a fan. And so then we'll have to screw the fan in there. Um, and so yes, yeah, so I work with screwdrivers. Um, I work with, um, yeah, lots of different computing elements. <laughs> but the screwdriver I think is one of the, the tools that I, I would see that I use. The top um, tool. <laughs> yeah, the top tool. <laughs> Very cool. Uh, so when you were in your office normally, what did your t day typically look like? Uh, my day, um, I would say it's, there's a percentage, maybe 30% in the lab, you know, building the computer systems. Um, there may be uh, some meetings where I would walk over to my mentor, uh, his cube, or his office would sit um, very close to mine to ask him lots of questions um, and just have brainstorming sessions in the hallway. Uh, I would have meetings where I share updates from my experiments with my team. Um, also meet with uh, marketing managers where we try to assess you know, the trends in the market and what type of technologies we should be creating. There may also be meetings with our customer, you know, the customer telling us, hey, you know, I want to design this new CAT scan. Um, what can you do to help me? Um, so yeah, my days were um, varied in, in, in the structure, but it's all pretty interesting. Yeah, yeah definitely. Um, so besides a vaccine and treatment during this whole COVID-19 pandemic, mm -hmm. what um, during this COVID-19 pandemic made you think of any ideas for inventions? Has anything uh, been inspiring during all of this? Uh, yes, um, I have thought about some. One thing I thought about was, you know, it would be kind of cool if there were vending machines that had like the, the PPE that we need, like gloves or sanitizers, uh, maybe outside supermarkets so that if you forget it, you can, you can just grab it right there, like grab a mask 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 on the go <laughs> uh, <clears throat> another idea i had was um uh i'm at the age where quite a few friends are getting married and so because of the pandemic uh many of them had to resort to zoom weddings or um you know smaller in-person weddings and so the idea i had would be more like an app where you know it, it withstands the time of the pandemic it allows you to reduce your guest list uh, but but then some of your some of your really close friends they get the VIP experience of being at your wedding, <laughs> and some of your acquaintances or people who are far far away and can't travel, they still get to be at your wedding just you know remotely, and I think that would be really cool. Yeah, it would be fun, and even extending that to like concerts or events. Yes, like and like baby showers, like everything. Yeah, I love <laughs> it. Um, so um, you have also been a, um, you've had an awesome path of being a biomedical engineer, but you've also have great experience of being an inventor. Um, so what in your opinion and experiments are the, or experience are the best first steps in becoming an inventor? Uh, I think I've hit on it before. It's, it's all about curiosity. Mm -hmm. uh, 
Um, do, you, do you see any problems that you have in the world? Or maybe, maybe you're not the one experiencing the problem, but you may see other folks having a problem that you'd like to solve. And so I would say 90% of the time as an inventor is really identifying the problem. Sometimes uh, engineers uh, create these gadgets uh, thinking that that gadget is gonna solve a problem and then they commercialize it. Nobody wants to buy that widget. Mm -hmm. um, but if you spend time really identifying the problem you're solving, then it's like the solution just like bubbles up in your brain because you know the problem. So um, I know we're gonna talk about it later, but I've written a children's book, Abby Invents Unbreakable Crayons. And in the book, you know, Abby, her problem is she's trying to color and her crayons keep breaking. So that means Abby's problem is very clear. The crayons break. Mm -hmm. So what can the solution be? Well, what if there's a crayon that never, ever, ever breaks? And so she invents the unbreakable crayon. But it's only because she was clearly able to identify the problem was she able to come up with an invention. Yeah, love that. Are there ever some good first questions you ask in any step of inventing? Uh, why? Why is, is like the fundamental question. You know, why do crayons break? Why, um, um, you know, why are ultrasounds so large? Can ultrasounds be the size of your smartphone? Or, um, I don't know, just why? <laughs> that's, that's like the best question. <laughs> Love it. Okay, and moving actually straight into um, your children's series, what inspired you to write your first book? Um, well, when I was in graduate school, I was in a lab of my last two years. There were 17 of us in the lab, and I was the only girl. And it bothered me that there were not many women in the lab with me. I mean, I, I loved my, my, my lab mates. It was probably like the best team I ever worked with. And we were creating cutting edge technologies, but there were no girls. And so I wanted to write a book that showed girls that they can be inventors too. Um, if I can do it, they can do it. If my character Abby can do it, they can do it. It's all about curiosity, asking questions and just going for it. And so that really was, was the reason why I started writing a children's book series. Love that. Um, did you, I guess, um, what would you say is the best way to build a story for any of our friends or viewers that have wanted to write, an, write a book on their own? So how, would, how do you build a story or what's the best way to do that? Honestly, my best ideas come while I'm taking a shower. <laughs> So usually I'm taking a shower and I have this brilliant idea. I hop out of the shower and I get my notepad and my pencil. I have them all over the house because you never know when an idea is going to come. And I scribble it down. It may not be fully formed. Maybe in the case of Abby and Vince, I knew Abby's name and I knew what she looked like before I knew what her story was going to be. And so I knew that she was going to be an inventor, but I had no idea what she was going to invent. And how I came up with the idea of unbreakable crayons was I was actually bored at work one day and I was doodling on a piece of paper. And I, it dawned on me that I'm doodling with a pen. Huh, kids doodle with a crayon. What's the problem with crayons? And so, so it's kind of like you just go with your thought process and then you start crafting the story. Now, the important thing to remember, though, is when you're writing a story, the first draft is not going to be the final draft. Uh, for Abby and Vince and Breakable Crayons, I think the published book is draft number 27. <laughs> and it took about a year for me to, to get to draft number 27. So you have to be very patient with your story, give your story characters, give it a beginning and the end, understand what the problem is you're solving in the story, make sure there is some drama and some failure. And then at the end, you know, the some good feeling. <laughs> Very cool. And who else was on your team when putting that story together? Was it uh, well, my, lots of editors or, yeah, sorry, go for it. <laughs> no, that's okay. Um, on my team, um, I would say my illustrator, Diana Nesculescu. Uh, she's Romanian. And um, 
after I, I draft out the manuscripts and get feedback from kids, uh, I read to a few schools so that kids could give me feedback. And actually the reason why the book has a glossary is because a fourth grader in Bermuda said, it would be nice if this book had some definitions because I don't know what a patent is. And so that's why the book has a glossary. So I got a lot of feedback from parents and teachers and kids to make sure that it was easily digestible uh, for kids. And um, in terms of illustrating, that took a year as well because trying to make sure that the vision I had for the character is what's seen in the pages. And um, you know the color scheme, there's a lot to do with illustrating that I took for granted. Um, you know, getting the hair right uh, for Afro hair is, is very difficult, which I did not realize. <laughs> um, so, so yeah, it, it took a lot of work, but I'm, I'm very happy with the outcome. Awesome. Um, so we are starting to get in an audience question. So okay. Tom was wondering um, how artificial intelligence is applied in medical imaging. And how do we make sure that artificial intelligence is giving us the right imaging information? That is a profound question, Tom. <laughs> so one example of artificial intelligence in medical imaging uh, is some work that some of my colleagues did where uh, it was for x-ray. And so sometimes if somebody gets into a horrible car accident, their ribs may get fractured and that may puncture the lungs. So what that results in is, you know, air, think of your, your lung as a balloon, air may be escaping from that lung, right? And so now your lung is a reduced size. Mm -hmm. And so when you take an X, when the physician takes the X-ray in the ER, it may show that the lung is reduced, but that physician may not be able to diagnose that patient. It, that image must be sent to a radiologist. But the problem is in the ER, you have lots and lots of people who come in with broken bones and other injuries, which may not be as critical as someone who has a collapsed lung. And so one way artificial intelligence is used is it's able to scan all the x-rays that are coming in and be able to identify that this is an x-ray of a patient with a lung that looks smaller than it should be. And so because of that, it causes, it rearranges the queue of images that are going to the radiologist. And so the most critical scan, which is the collapsed lung, will be all the way at the top of the radiologist's queue. And so it allows the radiologist to very quickly diagnose that, um, that, that issue with the patient and you know, get some uh, treatment as fast as possible. Wow, that's incredible. <laughs> Uh, and how, and the second part of that question was, how do we make sure AI is giving us the right imaging information? Ah, so before we uh, create, we, we put AI into uh, medical imaging uh, modalities, the first step is to actually train it. And so before, when you're, when you're getting, when you're developing the AI model, uh, you would train the AI with lots of images of this is a good lung, this is a collapsed lung, and you know thousands and thousands of images so that eventually the AI can identify what is a collapsed lung. And so this training is a very significant part of creating uh, these AI applications for medical imaging. Wow. Um, are there any engineers or scientists that inspire you? Yes. Um, I would say the one that inspires me uh, right now uh, is a Rosalind, um, she's one of the IFDEN ambassadors, Rosalind Rommel. And so she's an inventor at L'Oreal and she invented uh, the Super Stay Matte Lipstick Formulation, which is like the number one lipstick in the whole wide world. And so I just think it's, it's just amazing to be able to create a technology and see it in the stores in Walgreens and Walmart and Target everywhere. And, you know, she is about my age and I just think that's so inspiring. So she's that's probably awesome. my favorite scientist right now. <laughs> that's awesome. And what a fun way to use science too. I love it. Um, what is the most challenging thing you've experienced in your education or career and or career? And how did you deal and overcome? 
a good question. Um, one, I like that question because not often people talk about their failures. So one of the most challenging things I faced was when I was a graduate student at University of Michigan as a, as a biomedical engineering uh, graduate student. Um, there were, my experiment failed miserably for three years. And uh, I felt that all my peers were getting their papers published and I and my experiments were just not progressing the way I thought they would. And so in those moments where I felt like giving up, I just allowed myself to take a break, to rest. So I would say rest, don't quit. And so I would take walks in the park. Um, you know, just nature has a lot of healing power, I think. And so that would allow me to uh, rejuvenate my spirit and get back into the lab and to try it one more time. And uh, when it started working in my third, fourth year, I mean, it was, I'm just so happy I didn't give up because that's when my, my invention, I would say, started to blossom. And that's when I was able to create that uh, blood test that detects some cancer patients reject a bone marrow transplant. And um, from that, I have two patents. But before, before that, it, it was a lot of a lot of waiting and experimental failures before I got there. Awesome, love that. Um, and Ed, do you have any advice or words of encouragement for the next generation of STEM professionals? Of course. Um, I know often that we we speak negatively to ourselves. We may tell ourselves, you know, I can't do that, but my advice would be to replace I can't with what if I can. And better yet, visualize yourself doing the thing that you can't do and say, what if I do? And then when you tell yourself, you know, what if I fail? Well, reframe it and say, when I fail, because you will, when I fail, what lessons am I going to take away from that that's going to propel me forward? And so it's all about how you speak to yourself every day. And if you can breathe some positivity into your spirit, then I'm pretty sure you're going you're gonna to go far. Awesome. And then this might also bleed into the next question. If you could go back in time, what would you say to encourage your younger self when starting your STEM career? Um, I would tell my younger self, you know, just, just keep doing what you're doing. Um, it may feel like uh, you want to, you, it may feel hard, but you're, you're going to be okay. So be patient with yourself, you know, don't let a failed grade uh, hold you back. It's just one failure in a sea of successes. So, so just keep pushing. Awesome. Thank you. So what is next? We have, um, and for those that are watching at home or either later in our broadcast, um, we'll be posting links to uh, Arlene's book, Abby and Vent, but there's also part of a series. Yeah, if you just want to share a little bit about um, her unbreakable crayon story, but also <laughs> what else she's cooking up. Ah, uh, yeah. So um, in Abby and Vent's unbreakable crayons, as I mentioned, Abby's just tired of her crayons breaking. Uh, so she decides to make the first world's unbreakable crayons. And it's not as easy, as I mentioned, with inventing, there's lots of failures. So she, she fails a lot, but she doesn't give up. And she eventually comes up with this idea that she gets from the playground uh, with seeing materials that don't break. Mm. And so that's how she was able to invent unbreakable crayons and she gets a patent at the end. Very the Abby, <laughs> so the Abby and Event series is all about Abby, and in every title, she's going to get a patent. Uh, the next book will be most likely December timeframe, where Abby invents a folding machine because she thinks that it takes forever and a half to fold laundry, so she wants to make it faster. And so that's the next book. <laughs> I love that. Um, so for those that are watching and want to learn more, um, again, we'll be posting the links, but here we'll just say it. You can go to ArleneSimon.com to learn more about Dr. Simon's um, path in STEM as well as her inventions. Um, and if you would like to check out the book, you can go to, to is it Timoons.com? Yeah, Timoons. <laughs> um, and yeah, and we can, you can always keep an eye out for what happens next with Abby's um, fun curiosity and inventions. So we love that. Um, perfect. So 
Everyone, thank you so much for joining our Next Gen STEM program. Um, it's been really fun to learn more from our innovators. And if you guys have any questions or anything moving forward, please let us know. But thank you everyone for joining us today and have a great rest of your week. Bye everybody. Bye, thank you.